Um, Joe, <laughs> Joe is a senior lecturer in at the University of Bernal University. He was trained as a social worker. I will learn about you uh, in both in Israel and uh, the, in the United States and practice as a mental health social worker. Um, his research interests include migration, parenting, mixed families, gender, and has published many journal review articles and some, he says several books in these topics. He also worked collabor in the collaboration with uh, a number of master's students. Um, he published a number of articles in peer review journals, reporting uh, experience of migrant social workers from different countries, such as uh, South Africa, India, Zimbabwe, um, Australia, and Canada. In the past few months, I have had many conversations with Yohai talking about um, the experience of uh, migrant social worker, the challenges they come uh, they come across, and what we can do to support them during this transition period. Um, but this afternoon, Yo, I want to focus on something else. He wants to talk about what they can, instead of they learning, or we learning about what the system is about here. But there's a lot they have brought they can bring, and we can learn from them. And so Yo, Yo is going to talk about what transgender social worker can teach us. Uh, in the social work practice in the UK. So I have... Yeah, okay. Well, thank you. And uh, a warm welcome to everyone. Um, I migrated to um, the UK in 2007 after studying in working as a social worker in Israel and um, because of uh, work that I did before I came here with the mind of an anthropologist I was I was looking at this strange new culture that I was thrown into and uh, trying to understand it and I was uh, I was an anthropologist and I guess my work is really uh, shaped by that. So this this is the kind of thinking, um, you know, the, the history of anthropology is the history of uh, of Western people going into uh, the global south and, and and looking at those people and um, as a member of of that group, um, you know, I, Israel was colonized by by uh, the British. I was trying to look back. So, if if the gaze of the researcher is the, the analytical gaze, looking at the West and looking at the indigenous people, I was always thinking about looking back and trying to to use the same tools that that the Westerners, anthropologists, used to look at indigenous people, to look at English, British people, and see what is it that I, I can see. And I'll, I'll try to explain why I think this is important. Okay. Um, so first of all, this, this project is... Uh, well, I can, there are many beginnings, but one beginning for me was... Uh, this project uh, that I worked on with a large group of students, uh, I think just one of them is here. Um, all of them are master students. Um, I said I uh, shared the link uh, with those who are in the online meeting, so they they have the link to our web page. Um, you'll see that there are still, um, well, there are many publications there and there's still many um, surveys that are um, alive because we're still very much in the midst of, of this uh, project. So um, anyone who can help us, uh, we're still trying to recruit social workers from um, Nigeria, from Greece, from Germany, uh, from Ireland. Um, I think that's about it for now. So um, if you can, that would be great. Um, 
this is and, and what we found in this project we when we looked at the literature one of the things i uh, was very uh, clear about was that there was very little reference to the culture of, of the people uh, both the culture that they came from and the culture that they went to um and and this is what we try to focus on are you <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> um now we hear a lot well i hear the expectation that social workers will hit the ground running here and that they'll be able to quickly adjust right and we heard about uh, the fact that social workers, uh, uh, migrating social workers or diaspora social workers are very much implicated in these fitness to practice um, procedures more uh, you know, in a greater proportion than, than the share. Um, the literature says that they are rarely uh, involved in the capacity of educators and they are being always taking the place of the uh, students beginning uh, because the assumption is that they really have something unique to share. Um, and obviously this is uh, this is uh, troubling, but in a way it's not surprising because when you look at the literature about labor migration and there's vast amount of literature about labor migration, what you see in that literature is that, first of all, it is almost totally focused on migration of, from the global south to the global north, and usually um, um, not highly skilled by low skilled um, workers, basically black and brown people migrating to the west, and the west is very concerned about that. And uh, a lot of these studies are about uh, are trying to measure integration. And they are trying to see basically if you uh, I'll simplify it very much, but it's basically who became a modern individual, civilized, and who is still need to to become civilized and and need to to need to be uh, you know uh, become uh, well, it's a de the deficit model. They, they are lacking something, and we need to, to give them that something that they're lacking. There is no thought that there is uh, maybe an advantage. Or, or, um, now, it's really interesting to know. So this is the literature. The vast amount of the literature is about this. And it is clear connections with colonialism and imperialism, and the, those distinctions that uh, um, colonialists used to do between the civilized and the uncivilized. So that's that's the origin of this literature. The really interesting thing is that academics, they love disciplines, so and, and they work in silos. So there is a huge debate and discussion completely disconnected with this discussion, it talks about use terms like the stranger and the outsider insider. And key um, sociologists and philosophers contribute to this discussion. So people like uh, George Simmel, the um, sociologist, a very important German sociologist, but many others, Marx and Mannheim and, and lots of other people who spoke about this unique position of the stranger, who is for us equivalent to the immigrant. And they talk about the fact that this position of the stranger as someone who comes into a new culture and stays there, but he, this is someone who most of his life spent in a different culture. So he comes to this new culture and he or find him, his way and he's becoming part of this. But in his 
frame of mind, there is something else. Now, why, maybe, why is it, it is that important? It's important because in the, um, in the modern kind of, modern perception of science, the scientist was supposed to be detached, objective, floating in the air, not connected. But we are in a postmodern age and we understand that it's impossible, right? No one can detach the subjective element from, from what they see. So what we now say that, well, me, you're high, I had my own specific upbringing, education, and I'll see the world as a researcher or as a social worker from my own perspective. And you will see it from your own perspective and you from a different perspective, right? This is what we say. But this means that the knowledge of each one of us is partial. I can only see things from, from my eyes. So how do we overcome this? And this is the answer. So lots of scholars say, well, you see, that stranger, that immigrant, that person has the potential. It's not a necessity, has the potential because they have this frame of mind and this frame of mind, and they can move between these frame of minds. They, they talk about, they call it, it's a funny story term, but they call it, they call it distanciation. You can distance yourself more, whereas the, the person who just lived here all their life, they, they, they can't do that. This is what they see and, you know, the fish in the water. They become used to the, to the water and they don't see, but are unaware of the water. But that stranger, that inside and outside there, can shift between two or three perspective. So again, it's not a necessity, it's a, it's a potential. This position potentially can allow you that. Now, if you think about it, there is a whole discipline. Anthropology is a discipline that is all based on taking a researcher and shoving them in a, a new environment. And the just the fact of it being new forces him to interact or to, to, to meet, discover this new world. They, they keep bumping against, oh, why did they behave like that? Oh, I did this, but I didn't expect that they will behave in response in this way. What happened? So they keep needing to decipher reality. So this position of the outsider Potentially, with the right reading, analysis, theory, becomes a huge advantage. And not only in, in a better ability to understand social reality, but also in, a, in an ability to then respond in a much more creative way. Funny, isn't it? So potentially, there is a huge advantage here to this outsider, insider, if you cultivate it properly. Now, so going back to this set of what we said about uh, my uh, diaspora social workers much more or more likely to be implicated in these fitness to practice procedures, this is why we emphasized so much the, the issues around culture because we think that a better understanding of the local culture will potentially create, um, well, a, a better ability to, to, I don't know, call it adjust or function or, or, or you know, you, you need to understand the system to maximize your potential within it and, and your contribution within it. And one of the places where this potential of the outsider to better understand reality comes into fruition in the work of anthropologists. So if you look at the little literature that is on English culture, trying to understand English culture, what you see is that either, either one 
they are uh, outsiders, or if they are insiders, if they are English, or, or they will then, like one of the people that I value the most is, and I talk about her to all my students, Kate Fox. If you read who are the people that she uh, interviews, largely they are they are outsiders. They are immigrants, or they are visitors, or tourists, or for the same reason. So what I'm going to do in the rest of the time that I have is tell you a little bit about what these outsiders or these uh, observers say about English culture and where I think social workers might have difficulties with that and what they might know. It will be a very rushed journey, but you get you get a flavor, you'll get some ideas. Okay. Um, yeah, we spoke about, I, I forgot my slides completely. We spoke about the immigrant integration and we this is with stranger, we did this and we did this. Okay, so um, yes. And I, this is what they say. It's all starts here in this, the fact that it's an island. And why is it so important? And so what I'm going to tell you from here on is based on things I read and then, you know, a series of scholars and uh, some references at the end. So, um, island. And what happens in an island is that um, you've got a natural uh, boundary. And this natural boundary, you know, after we, we know that the Romans uh, uh, invaded and conquered uh, this island, and we know that the Vikings were here. But there was a long period, almost 800 years, that this island was relatively with no real threat, which is phenomenal. If you would compare it to anything in mainland Europe or in any other place, you would be amazed by how many revolutions take over, countries are just completely changing and swapping and, and kinds of, of uh, rule. So there was a huge period of time in which this place enjoyed an immense stability, safety, and, and, and because of that, it had lots of implications. So part of the implications were um, a stable monarchy, um, separateness, sense of uniqueness. You, you could see why people would like to go back to that in Brexit. You know, it was so good. We were so safe. It was so good. Why, why, why wouldn't we uh, want to? Uh, it was great. Um, but there were lots of other implications. Um, when, you are, when you have this natural boundary, you don't need this huge army. And keeping a huge army is a huge expense, national expense. So when you don't need to do that, taxes can be lo lowered, quality of life is higher. And you can, what you need is a good navy, which then allows you to become an empire. Um, Now, this is still really far from, uh, um, wh wh why is that? What does that have to do with social work? Oh, no. We'll get there. We're getting there in a second. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to go into all the ins and outs, even though they are important, but there's relatively little time. How much more time do I have, by the way? Five minutes. <laughs> This is stingy. No, no, I'm going. That's really stingy. Um, okay. Um, so when you have, I, I really like this quote, but there are many variations on it. 
what what um think about the situation and what forces people to come together into large groups threats challenges limited resources when all of these things are much less emphasized each can pursue their own interests uh, you know i don't have to live in this big clan or, or big group to be protected life is it's it's okay i'm safe i can do what i want to do and and it's very natural it's very humane you can understand that people want when well there are reasons why people congregate um now this is a, another long discussion around individualism but what is the fascinating thing is that england is an individualistic country much earlier than people would assume that in in english law in inheritance law there is an emphasis on individualism and in individual ownership of property way 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 back uh, and, and and in a totally different way to what was in other parts of of the world really strong emphasis on individualism um and this has strong implications on the relationships in families so there was no expectation of parents um uh leaving the uh whatever they they have to their children you could do whatever you wanted to do with your stuff so there was no expectation and your children were expected to go and make their own you know fortune and life and 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 the same was uh the other way around children were not expected to uh to take care of their parents in in the same way it was it was different the, the, if there was more, if there'd be more time i'm happy to go into the detail um but this means th this is for us working with with service users i think this is something that is important um this emphasis on individualism you can see it in um english uh, law the emphasis of what we call negative freedoms and negative politeness again really important terms limited time to explain but both means negative politeness is politeness that is defined by what i'm supposed not to do so i'm supposed to not intrude into your space not interfere not uh, um yes not impose so basically yeah all those things not by if if a simple way to explain that um for an english person we would say my house is my castle and polite behavior would be polite behavior would be never come knocking on my door unannounced the positive politeness cultures would be mi casa su casa you come you knock on my door i'll open the door and i'll give you a glass of water and so these this is a very simple way but it's a whole system um that is set in a very particular way and connected with what we call negative freedoms again which are the basis of liberalism and neoliberalism and a critical sociologist would would say it's a whole system that is created to largely benefit the rich and again this is from the literature so uh, a, a whole system that includes codes and ideas around politeness um another key issue that social workers really struggle with is this emphasis um on well 
I'm moving to the next thing, but they're all connected. The separation between um, the private and the public space. In very few cultures, there is such a sharp separation between the private and the public. If you think about uh, home visits, in an, in a you know in many cultures, the house is often the place where you the social life, the wider social life is happening. But in English culture, and again, I'm quoting sociologists happy to uh, send you to those um, social life are beyond the, the, the nuclear family are largely happening outside. So there's lots of social activity. People go to clubs, people go to all kinds of, of uh, uh, societies, lots of socializing, but it is largely happening outside. And there are difficulties and implications. So for example, when people get older and they can't get involved in all those social activities, those social relationships often not follow, are not following them into the home. Um, two more minutes. Okay. Um, if, if you think about working class homes, they are even less likely to invite people uh, beyond the nuclear family into their home. So home, a home visit is a really intrusive thing. Whereas in other cultures, it's it's much more natural. It's not not a problem. Um, again, if we say that politeness is about non intrusion, again, and and again, I'm quoting from the literature. There are lots of cases explaining that um, family members are hesitant in coming and and offering intimate help to a family member because they are afraid of being experienced as intruding or imposing. So this is just about the separation and there's so many aspects to this. Um, religion, probably you all are aware, of, but they are all connected in a culture that is relatively, the English religiosity is a very particular religiosity. It's very moderate. It's very, um, yeah, it's, it's a whole new discussion, but we know that many of the social workers arriving to here are coming from a more religious background and, and often there are challenges there. Now, uh, if we remember everything that we said about individualism and the, the, the strong emphasis on, on individualism, my interpretation, people lose practice in, in socializing. So again, this term, the English social disease, I love this term and not mine, it's Fox. She, this is one of her main um, uh, sort of uh, ideas. She describes the English as, as suffering from this social disease, difficulty in, 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 in creating social relations. Now, she also explained, presents as a set of, of practices that are helped to, uh, are used to help create and, and facilitate these social interactions. Uh, but I think this is, this is really important to understand. Um, I'm quickly moving to, to another term. This, as a result of all of those things, there is a very particular, what I call English emotional grammar. So what kind of emotions are allowed to be expressed and when and with whom? Um, you know, generally the status of emotions in, in English culture is not very high. If you've seen just recently after the death of the queen, the the Meghan and uh, what, uh, her husband were criticized for for showing the slightest expression of emotions. I think they held hands or something like that, or you know, expressing emotions 
and expressing emotion in, in a professional capacity is even worse. For many of us who come from cultures where expressing emotions is, is, is more okay or even healthy, this easily gets us into trouble. Um, there's loads more, but I think that what we need to do is, first of all, come to, to this thinking about being a stranger or an immigrant as potentially a superpower. And and we just need to develop it, cultivate it. I don't mean I don't I don't think we need to you know uh, create our own silos, but our uniqueness and our and the fact that we come from different places and we hold different perspectives is our strength. So I would definitely say that that when we talk about anything that we need to do, we I would start from from that place. And if you if you think about I'm I'm also thinking that for an institution receiving um new social workers from abroad and any new social workers rather than rather than tell them this is how we do it here do it our way it's also a great opportunity for these institutions to say hey come and look at what we do tell us what you think about how we do it and let's see if i can explain to you in a rational and uh, that way that will make sense to you and to me why we're doing it this way you know uh, it's like it, it's a great opportunity for every institution to to actually see why why are we doing it this way you know and, and what do people think about how we we do it and what can we learn from what they say about how we do it? And and yeah, I don't know. So that's it. This is these are my thoughts, and um, oh, be a very simple. Well, question time. So, um, Pospa, are you still there? Yeah. yeah. Is there anyone want to ask question? Both you online and here. You can raise your hand or type your question or feedback in chat. Questions in the chat? Steph? Not yet, so I'll, I'll let them know they can ask. Any, any more? Yes. So my question is for Pastra. Uh, um, so for the anti oppressor practices, um, what's, uh, I guess, how, how do you navigate uh, practice for working with colleagues uh, that might be dismissive of what you're trying to introduce or to at least um, have a, a brief conversation space? How do you how do you navigate that? OK, pause for a Do you hear it? Yeah. Some of that, sorry, some of that question was missing. Um, how do you navigate something with colleagues? I missed the in-between bit. About anti-oppressive practice, how do you implement it or actually put it in action in your workplace, in the workplace? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I, th I think there are a number of things. You'll, you'll start any, or you hopefully start any new job with um, your job description, what you're meant to be doing and, and so on and so forth. And you'll have a supervisor and a team manager in terms of that line management. So you can start with a simple question of asking what is the existing policy? Um, how is anti-oppressive practice operationalized in that setting, in that children's team, in that mental health team, not just towards service users, which is what we tend to hear, but also in and amongst colleagues. And so you can start with that question um, and then begin to unpick it that way. I mean, you could bring in your own kind of suggestions, um, but most of the time you kind of have to be there for a little while to find out. But I, for those who know me, they know that um, 
I'm quite open with how I feel. Actually, my face says it all usually, um, that if there's something that's happening that's not great, I will be asking you about it. Um, but I'll be asking you ways that enable um, you to not feel cornered or targeted. And, and, and so you have to find the balance. But I would say if you're new in an organization, then you've got to ensure that you start your day one, your week one, your induction, whatever that looks like by saying what is or what does anti-oppressive practice look like in this organization and how how are you guys, you know, avoiding oppressive practice? You've got to start from somewhere, haven't you? So that's what I would suggest. Now, a number of people will say to me years later, oh, it's been like this forever and I've just ignored it. But suddenly I've, I have, you know, I've experienced too much of it. That is in itself concerning because if we're not able to challenge and or address issues of oppression for ourselves within the workplace, what are we doing with service users? Are we helping and supporting them to get the best um, outcomes in terms of service provision or are we just going with whatever anyone's telling us? So I hope that's answered the question. Basically, I didn't hear it very well, but I'm, I'm hoping that's helped. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you Prosper. Any more questions? Okay. Really helpful there. Some of the cultural behaviors that I've seen, um, you know, it really puts context to, um, you know, the culture. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, for the benefit of the people online, uh, it's just a comment um, from the audience on your high uh, presentations about the insights we gather from uh, the importance about understanding, knowing about your own culture and the mix and the tension, um, how that the interplay of different culture and that is also what we need to be aware of it and how that may can impact on practice. Do I do I sum up correctly? Yeah, thank you. No, that's not I think it's just repeating, commenting. Just, it was we, just a thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not a question, so any yeah so thank you my my question follows up from, from your knowledge thank you johan uh the presentation i could really connect with a lot uh, of what you said i wish i had access to this golden wisdom when i migrated to the uk and it's never too late and i'm very grateful i'm here in this room and I am aware that perhaps not many people have this opportunity to be here in this room and to have this So my question would be, how could this be integrated in uh, workplaces, uh, even as part of perhaps induction, uh, for only one person to practice, and not for people who provide it here, and not just in the body, but for anyone? Uh, um, sorry, go ahead. Do you want to oh, come up to? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I have an answer. Uh, well, this, I'm 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 going to write about these things, but uh, hopefully there'll be maybe an induction program. Who knows? We'll see, or some kind of a a program that will help. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, where diaspora social workers uh, do this, make this. Social working network to, to develop and enroll it into that in every local authority and principal social work is champion because it's about practice, it's about changing the culture within the organization and embedding. So it's fantastic, and you should I would advocate you actually. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Johan. Thank you. Put our new because I think one of the problems we've had when we're thinking about cultural competence is about learning about the culture of the racialized others, not everybody. Exactly. I think you know, in order to kind of really cultivate cultural competencies to be able to look inside, and everybody has culture, not just us here. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. it's actually the, the point that you're making today, and maybe the idea is that we reframe the idea of cultural capacity. It's not just to kind of put gaze on us, <laughs> because it's never just about us. Yeah. Well, the powerful, it's, it's yeah. quite known that the powerful prefers to stay unseen, yeah. invisible. 
we see them. <laughs> yeah, we need to. Yeah, I think it's important that we see them. So we get connected with all things that were said. Yeah. Just for the we've, yeah. We've just got one more question online, and I think we need to leave it after okay. that. Okay. Michael, do you want to read it? Sure, it says it's a vision of diaspora school work knowledge. What are your thoughts on the benefits and drawbacks of its creating book majority and Western knowledge? It's a Again, the question, say again. The social work knowledge. What are your thoughts on the benefits and drawbacks of integrating the global majority in this OSC integrate? Well, I yeah, uh, great. Yeah, let's let's uh, let's integrate. But maybe first uh, allow um, you know uh, global South knowledge to be heard before you know before you do fusion uh, kitchen. Just uh, let's have some. Uh, you know, yeah, authentic. Uh, you know, global South kitchen here, and and then and then we can do a fusion. We can start the kitchen here. So. <laughs> you know, but uh, no, I'm I'm all for fusion. But it it would be good uh, to have. Yeah, I said it. You know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your contribution. And so now we will take. 10 minutes. 10 minutes break. So when we come back at um, Bill Cop, so we will have the um, uh, seminar free will be streamed online here. So that will be the group seminar talking about excellent practice uh, in NHS pastoral care award. Okay. So for the the seminar for that is about the challenges and opportunities for diaspora social workers will be in the room meet. So just a word next door, but one. So we go to the, the seminar at about three, and then we'll come back here for the penetry. Well, maybe discussion. Grab your coffee and go over there. Cool. I'll stay here. Cool. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>